Chad Carson, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast, man. We, we so appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us. Happy to do it. Thanks for asking me back. No, of course, of course. So you wrote an article that got published on Bigger Pockets, and we're going to link to that in the show notes. But the article is called Why the Massive Real Estate Empire You Think You Want Won't Give You the Life You Imagined. So we're going to have you read an excerpt from this article, but I would love to know, to kick things off, what made you write this article? What was kind of your inspiration? Yeah, so I, I wrote a, a lot on Bigger Pockets. I haven't written as much lately, but I also wrote a book for Bigger Pockets. And so I just I love the ecosystem of Bigger Pockets. I love the the team behind the scenes. They're, they they it's just a great service to real estate investors. And I think I, as I was immersed in a lot of that, though, I, I think I heard a common refrain, and it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. But a lot a lot of the podcasts, a lot of the articles you read, the ones that really stood out were the ones talking about get as big as you can. You need to syndicate. You need to get right. th- thousands of units, and that was exciting. I guess it makes you know I'm a podcast host. You're a podcast host. It makes it makes exciting uh, you know headlines when you have this person who bought 50 properties in one year, and that's amazing. But as I thought about it, like the people I knew, both in like the non non famous people, like nobody even knows who they are, but they have tons of lifestyle and they have flexibility and they do what matters to them. A lot of these people had like five properties or three properties and they had paid them off and they were really simple and you know they, they, it was nothing to write home about so supposedly um, but it was <laughs> but if, if you if you measure things a little bit differently it actually was pretty incredible and so I wrote the article to try to to tell that story and to explain kind of my point of view on that and the 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 headline was you know go small or go home because the Grant Cardones of the world were saying, you need a 10 X or otherwise you're no good, you know? And right. he in particular, I, you know, maybe I can get Grant Cardone on my show one day and have a, have a, a discussion, <laughs> have a him. chat with him. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to be kind of the, 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 the foil to that. Not, not because that's wrong, not because people shouldn't get big and go big. Like I'm not saying that what I'm saying is all of us who think keeping things simple and going small is just perfectly fine and actually preferred I wanted to give a voice to that for those people and make it make an make an argument why that's actually a better thing in many in many ways. Awesome, love it. I love I, that. I, I stumbled on this at like the perfect time because I, I was starting to have that internal conflict where I'm like, man, am I just not thinking big enough? Like, I think this is what I want, but you see it everywhere, like you mentioned, like everyone saying, "Oh, I just took down a hundred units here," and it starts to be like, is that what I need to do to be successful? And I love that this reframes that. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So let's jump into it, Chad. If you want to kick us off here and tell us this, a story of three real estate investors. All right. Great. Yeah. I'm going to get my, my place here. All right. So a story of three real estate investors. And I got, I got to give a little background to this before I start reading it, because I actually got this story from other people, as many stories come from. And actually, a, a real estate investor named Jack Miller, who was a teacher for many years, he's now passed away, but he was a really good teacher. And I used to go to seminars with him early on in my my career. And, and I, I'm pretty sure I got this story from him. He probably got it from somebody else as well. But I, I adapted it for my own purposes. And so the, the story goes that there were one summer, there were three real estate investors and they were they're couples and they traveled to, they were uh, going to travel together to Europe and these investors had originally met each other as beginner investors in the bigger pockets forum and they liked each other a lot and they helped each other kind of grow along the way and so they became friends and then about 15 years later uh, they each had experienced some success with the real estate bu- business and they wanted to kind of go and enjoy the fruits of all of their efforts because why why not right um, so they they decided to go spend 14 days together visiting the Mediterranean coast. First, they were going to go explore some ancient cities in Italy, like enjoying some amazing food, some good wine, perhaps. And then they were going to continue with a high quality, kind of a Mediterranean cruise that would stop in Croatia and Greece. And they'd even go to one of my friends, uh, another Bigger Pockets author, his home country, Arian Shihai, lives in, uh, was from Albania, has family still in Albania. He's from there originally. So another cool place. So could, could these investors afford a nice trip like this? So you can imagine going to Italy and going on the Mediterranean coast. Well, let's take a look at the financial scoreboard to see if they could actually afford it or how they could afford it using their real estate. So couple number one was Liz and Tom, and they are in their 50s, and they live, invest, and self-manage their properties in Missouri, in the state of Missouri. And over the last 15 years, they've bought 10 single-family houses, one by one, in good neighborhoods. 
Liz and Tom searched hard to buy these houses as fixer-uppers, so they needed some work. They were able to buy them below value because of that. And they used the burst strategy to recoup most of their cash on each deal. So they would kind of re recycle their cash, buy another deal, fix it up, get it rented, do another deal. Um, and then they would use what's called the debt snowball technique to pay off their mortgages early. And that's something I talk a lot about as well. And so they started with the burr, they got loans, they paid off their debt. And so now their houses produce $7,000 per month or $84,000 per year in positive cash flow. So that's couple number one. Couple number two, Tiffany and Darius are in their early 40s. They live in New York and they invest in North Carolina using a property manager. And 15 years after they started, they now own one 50-unit apartment building. Tiffany and Darius began with smaller properties, and then they used a 1031 exchange, so a tax-free exchange, to kind of trade up from those smaller properties into these bigger properties until they had enough equity for a down payment on the, the big 50-unit building. So they, they have the 50-unit building has a solid fixed interest 25-year mortgage. And the property itself, after paying all their expenses, produces $10,000 per month or $120,000 per year in positive cash flow. So that's couple number two. Couple number three is Mike and Lauren, and they're in their late 40s. They live in Nevada and they own properties all over the country. 15 years after they started, they now have 500 units. Mike and Lauren began with their their rentals, but they, because of their ability to put together great deals, they also began, began syndicating deals by uh, pooling money from other people. So they were the general partner and they, they recruited money from other people. Their portion of the rental income equals over $30,000 per month or $360,000 per year. Their portfolio produces the most money out of all three couples. So it's pretty clear to see, we got into the weeds there, but all three couples can easily afford to pay for this nice European vacation. You know, money is not the issue. This, this is exactly why all of them began investing in the first place. But the story gets a little more interesting as they approach the end of this trip. So let's extend the trip a little bit. By the end of this trip, all three couples have had a fabulous time. It's been great so far. In fact, couple number one, Liz and Tom propose, hey, let's all stay a few weeks longer. You know, there's a lot more to explore here. We're already here. Why don't we just do that? Liz and Tom's rentals are full of self-reliant tenants who automatically deposit their rent each month, and the tenants can email or leave a voicemail with any kind of maintenance emergencies if they come up, but this rarely happens. And with no debt or immediate plans to buy more properties, their business schedule is amazingly flexible. Couple number two, Tiffany and Darius, they check their calendars. They have a few community and church functions, but those, they can put those off until later. And so their property and their property manager is very competent and in control of the day-to-day -day issues on their 50 unit building. And because there's no major financing or remodeling projects looming, they happily agree to stay over as well. But couple number three, Mike and Lauren have some challenges. They want to stay and can easily afford the expense of extending the trip, but there are projects looming back at home. Remodeling contractors are waiting for their guidance on some recent value add apartment purchases they made. A new property manager needs to be found to replace an underperforming one on some, on some of their units. Their corporate bookkeeper and administrator need help. And some of their equity investors want to meet with them to discuss some past and future projects. As a result, Mike and Lauren regretfully decline the vacation extension. So this kind of leads me to one of the main points of this is the myth of the passive big business. Mike and Lauren do not have a bad business. In fact, it is financially the most successful business of the three investors. But here are the questions I always ask to the Mike and Laurens of the world. Did your investment business meet your true goals? Are you spending your time doing what's most important to you? And would alternative approaches have met your goals just as well with less hassle and less risk along the way? Because it's possible that Mike and Lauren are happy with the current situation. If they are, like more power to it to them. I'm happy for them. But my experience has shown that many people in their situation are less than happy. The extra money that they have has come at a cost. And I'm sure I can get examples from all sorts of people listening to this uh, with comments about Shark Tank hosts and famous entrepreneurs and BP, you know, Bigger Pockets podcast guests and other people on the podcast who've built really big businesses that also check all of those goals off the list. Now, I'm sure they're out there. 
And it's fine to provide those successful examples. But the bottom line is, you, the person listening to this, what are your goals? And what's the best way to achieve them? Are you a Shark Tank host? Or are you just a regular person like me and who's trying to free yourself from the nine to five grind so that you can live an extraordinary life? So I know a lot of real estate investors. I know a lot of entrepreneurs. And at least in my experience, the ones with the most money have big businesses. And if that's your number one, number one metric, like go for it. Go for the big business. But the ones I know with the most free time, if that's what you want, the most flexibility are the ones that have, and also the ones that have less stress, have smaller, simpler businesses and portfolios. And interestingly, I don't see these smaller investors worrying that they have a smaller net worth than the big investors. It seems they're too busy enjoying their life. Ah. It's so good. So good. It's so much so better good. when Chad reads it for us too. <laughs> yeah, it, it it really hits quite differently. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chad, is this something that you've applied to your life? Have you always known this or is this something that you came across kind of later in your investing career? No, like I'm the kind of person that has to get smacked upside the head by a two by four <laughs> before I learn anything. So I, I don't want to act like I'm I've got any like prior knowledge here. Um like my a brief version of my story was in 2007, my business partner and I were like kind of following the, that path a little bit, you know, like that, Hey, let's get bigger, bigger is better. And it, it was, you know, just honestly, it was like looking at goals of other investors who we admired. Like we admired these people. They were really good and it was fun. And I'm, I played sports in life. I'm a competitor. Like I just think it's fun to go compete for something. And, and so we did the same thing and we were, we had uh, in 2007, 39 closings, some of those closings had, and those are all acquisitions closings. And some of those were multiple properties, so, you know, like big, uh, some multi-unit apartments. Some of those were flips, we were buying, fixing, and flipping it. Some of them were buying and hold rentals. But we were like really, really busy. But we we kind of took a step back, and I'll have to give credit to my business partner. It's my 50-50 business business partner who we've been together from the very beginning, and he kind of pushed back on it more than I did, saying like, "Wait a minute, like you know, we're we're so busy, and we've made some money this year." But like, is it, what are we trying to accomplish here? Like, are we really like moving towards the goals? And we actually sat down and had like a, a you know, kind of heart to heart business meeting where we each wrote down on a piece of paper, like, what are the things that are really most important to us? Or, what, or more specifically, like, what would we spend our time doing if money were no object? It's such a good exercise. I, I encourage everybody to do it. And the kinds of things I wrote down at that time as a 27 year old, and I just got married that year where I wanted to go play basketball, pick up basketball in the middle of the day for two hours. I wanted to go hiking in the woods with my wife. I wanted to travel abroad and do some things like that. Now, some of those cost money, like traveling abroad costs some money, but like playing pickup basketball for two hours, hiking in the middle of the day, like that costs zero money. But the biggest limitation was how much free time and flexibility I had. <clears throat> and at that time, I did not have the flexibility and free time. And I was like, wait a minute, like, what, what am I doing here? And so it just is, it sort of reminded us, and again, give my credit to my business partner and also maybe reading books like the four hour work week, I think kind of hit me upside the head a little bit too, that, you know, there's another way you, you were in control of how you build your business. There's no, nobody telling you, you have to buy a certain number of units. There's nobody telling you you have to run it a certain way. Like you are the architect of your business. And how you build that real estate business will determine how much free time and flexibility you have. So it's, it's up to me, it's up to you to be able to do that. That's so good. That's so good. Have you, so when you came to that realization, did you put a new goal in place? Like, okay, here's the goal. And did you, I, I'm always curious about like, like the way this kind of happens for me is I set a goal, we reach it and then like anyone who's kind of type A, the goalpost changes. All right, now we did that. What's next? And so, like, yeah. I'm just curious how you've dealt with that over the years. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. Um, I think I think we all are. It's like the hedonic treadmill <laughs> idea. I think just built into our psychology is that we get to something and we're like, oh, that was nice. Let me get the next piece of candy. You know, like yeah. that's just what we do. <laughs> um, I, but I did. I, I found something that I don't know where I read this or heard about it. But if you make if you make goals for experiences and transformation those actually tend to last a little bit more, or at least you have the memories of them. And I think it was from the four hour work week that kind of inspired me to start taking some mini retirements. And so we actually made a goal, my wife and I did, um, to travel abroad. Like it was like, let's not wait, let's not wait until we're, we're old to do this. Like it, we had the money, like we were saving money, we lived frugally, we're making good money. 
And it was more about just, I need to like build some systems into this business in order for us to be able to travel for multiple months at a time. And so we, you know, it took us a while. It took us like a year, year and a half to really detach ourselves from some of the things that we had going on to build systems in the business where I had some other people doing things that I was doing prior uh, previously. And then also just working with my business partner to say, all right, what systems am I running? What systems are you running? How can we automate this? How can we um, make some, you know, do some things remotely? And so by 2009, so we, that was like into 2007, when we kind of had the aha moment, 2008, and then 2009, in August of 2009, my wife and I went on a kind of our first big mini retirement where we got the backpacks out, went to Spain for six weeks. I learned to speak Spanish. She was already fluent in Spanish. Um, and then we, it was a little higher dollar in Spain and we loved it in Spain, but we also wanted to go to South America. So we flew back and went to uh, Peru and stayed there for a month in Arequipa, Peru, and just loved it. And that's where I really learned to speak Spanish at that point. And then we traveled down to Chile and hiked around in Patagonia, kind of the southern tip of South America, um, then came back up to Buenos Aires and spent some time there. And along the way, met so many amazing people, uh, other people traveling, other people who live there locally. And it was just, it was one of those, like for a type A person, you know, like one of those experiences where like physically, like about eight weeks into that trip, I felt like a knot, like untied in my chest where I was like, wait a minute. Like I didn't realize that knot was even tied. And now this thing is untying. And Latin America in particular for me, just has a special place because I feel like there's a, um, there's just a kind of ethos of, of, of connection with other people and relationships and, and the value of slowing down. Like we, we Americans do not always appreciate that. Like, but they, there and probably other places in the world as well appreciate the value of slowness and deliberateness. And so that that trip for me was kind of transformational because it got me hooked on that. And it got me hooked on, you know, Emil, like goals that are a little bit different, more difficult to quantify, but so much more impactful on, on who you are and on your life. Just quick side note, Chad, I'm so glad that you mentioned that you really learned Spanish when you were down in Peru. Cause I say, Holy crap, six weeks in Spain and you learned Spanish. Like no. how embarrassing for me. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I was, I was doing a little bit there, but, and I had taken one semester at the end of college and I spoke German in college. So I kind of had one, one foreign language that helped when you learn the second one, it's a little bit easier, but right. and I, 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 I hesitantly say that I speak Spanish because it's like up and down and you know, I was very fluent then. Sure. And since, since then I we went to Ecuador and I got better and it just, I still have my gringo accent and I still, <laughs> of, know, course, of course, of <laughs> course, but I have a Spanish teacher at home who can, who can correct me. Luckily. Perfect. It's, it's funny. Cause I had a bit of a similar smack upside the head to you in that I, I have a good friend of mine who's, who's really become more of a mentor and he's a young gun like me. And he's like growing, 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 growing as fast as he can and, and recommends doing the same thing. And he's like a thousand units. That's where I'm at. And then I have another very close friend who's 66. So he's quite a bit older in his career. And he's like, dude, like, is this in line with your life plan and life goals? And I was like, I didn't even think to ask that question when I started, because all I could see was right in front of my, my face, mm -hmm. right? Grow, grow, grow. This is what I can do now. This is what I can do now. And I'm hitting this, I'm running after this unit count and this cash flow count, yeah. not even thinking about what does this mean for my life? And so it, I think it's so important to take a step back even when you're just beginning, even if you do have the ability to grow, 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 but stop and ask yourself for every single question, is this aligned with my life plan and goals? Right. And also the pace. One thing I read about in the article that I didn't mention here, just now, we didn't talk about is the pace at which you grow. Like, you know, if it took you 30 years to get a thousand units versus taking you five years to get a thousand units, like those are two, those, those are two different like scenarios because you probably have to have a different relationship with debt a different relationship with leverage, different relationship with just speed and pace. Mm -hmm. and so like, like there, there's nothing wrong with growing, but like, even if your ambition is growing, it's like, how are you doing? Are you doing in a way that um, I compare it to like climbing a mountain? Like if you want to climb Mount Everest, I've, I've, my wife and I tried to do this one time. We were in a canyon, like climbing a canyon in South America going down. And I was like, you know, oh, we, we've got this. We're like hiking all the time. And I went fast up the, up the, the, uh, the way back up and I almost passed out, like, because I went way too fast and I, you know, didn't have enough water and dehydration. And I, I compare that the same thing. If, if you were a professional mountain climber, you wouldn't just go straight to the top of Mount Everest. Like you would go up, 
you would de- you know, accept, you know, acclimatize a little bit, come back down, go up a little bit more, acclimatize. And I think that's a more reasonable approach to business as well. And, but it requires something that very few of us, myself included, have a hard time with is patience. Like you gotta be patient and, and be willing to just plug along, hike slowly. Mm-hmm. That's so difficult, I know it is for me. It, well, it is so difficult, especially when you have the means and you think you have the ability or the bandwidth or what have you, and you're like, oh, it's right here, it's so easy. I'm, I'm already doing this, so what's another project? What's one right. more project? What's one more project? And it, it becomes very easy. Again, yeah, my, my, Emil's laughing. Ask Michael how he knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's really scary and, and it kind of can overwhelm you. And, and I talk about this on, on prior episodes, but I, I left my nine to five engineering job last uh, August in 2019. And that first week that I didn't have a job, I was the busiest I'd ever been in my entire life. Mm-hmm. And it's because I was taking on project after project after project, thinking I could handle it. And it just, it, yeah, it really consumes you. And so I have very uh, hardly adapted since then that I think smaller is better. And I love, love, love that you talk about the debt snowball. I think that often hits people upside the head pretty quickly and like, oh, you mean I don't have to go buy 15, 20, 30 units? I can just focus on the six, seven, eight, nine I have and pay those off and get the same result. I think it's pretty eye-opening. What well, one other thing? I there's uh, in the article there's this image that you have at the top of the article called the fulfillment curve, and it shows like fulfillment going up as you have survival, comfort, small luxuries, and at the top you have like mm-hmm. a star saying enough, and then it starts to come down and says clutter, complexity, and hassle. I think for for a lot of people who invest in real estate who by their nature are super frugal and don't even like like spending money. It's like you're going to get a lot of money and then do do like yeah, you can grow, you can expand things, but most likely we're all just going to be like chipmunks storing more money in a bank account. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, I got to give credit for that and I actually got permission to use that in the book I wrote Retire Early with Real Estate from Vicky Robin, your your money or your life. Um, is, is my favorite, probably my favorite financial books. So if, if people haven't read that, it's kind of an old school book. This, they've got a new version a few years ago. Um, but it's the, the concept of that enough, like is such a dip is kind of like patience. You know, mm-hmm. it's one of those difficult things to get with money <laughs> and the, 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 the fulfillment curve you're mentioning, like the, if you think about the very first hundred dollars you earn, right out of college or right out of high school or something like that hundred dollars will buy you like tons of pizza. It'll buy you like, you know, a little bit of, you'll value food. It can get you, you know, some clothes, numerous like, beers. Yeah. Numerous <laughs> beers. Like you're going to get a lot of satisfaction out of that first $100. Right. Um, but if you fast forward that, and if you keep going up more and up more, like you're going to get to a point, this is difficult to find that point, but you know, there's a point where every extra dollar you get is going to mean you're going to have to work a little bit longer you're going, to, you're going to have to buy extra. You're going to be buying more stuff. It's going to make, complicate your life. You're going to get boats. You're going to get cars. You're going to, now that you have this fancy car, you're going to be worried about somebody running by it one day with a key and like scratching your fancy car. Um, and, and, and so, so there, there's just, it comes with worry. It comes with anxiety. And so fi- what uh, some of the philosophers like uh, Henry David Thoreau, who I really admire, like the transcendentalist and H- Emerson, you know, if you look at some of them and the Stoics and the Roman Stoics, they they were <clears throat> about being happy with what you have and finding the place that's enough for you. And, and very often they would say like money and wealth is an obstacle like to being happy, like to f- being fulfilled that you actually feel like you have enough. And, and that's another thing I've just admired in my own travels. Like you meet some people who you stay with in their guest house or whatever, who have a lot less money than you but you talk to them and see how much joy they have and see how generous they are. You don't need a lot of money to, to be, do that. And when you think about the people you really admire in your life, how, who are the most generous and who are the most happy and bring the most joy to your life, you know, there's a disconnect that has nothing to do with money. And, and so I, I think that's, that's not, again, not something I'm perfect with, but it's at least challenged me to think about like, where does money fit into that relationship? Like, why do I need money? I need money to take care of the necessities I need money to make us comfortable. Like I want us to live in a house that's warm and I want us to live in a place that's safe. So of course, but when you get beyond that, when you start getting the biggest house and when you start getting five houses and when you start to live in and you start getting the nicest cars, there, there's no doubt there's some baggage that goes along with those that I think makes, at least for my, my own life, makes me even less happy. I think you touched on something previously that I want to circle back to in that 
you know, when you put goals and ambitions around experiences rather than material things or dollar amounts, you can, I, I think it, it's lasting longer as, as I think the way you said it. And I totally agree. I also think that as kind of a, a good thought experiment and exercise, you should write down, you know, what it is that you want to do for a year. If you could walk away from your job for a year, what do you want to do? And then figure out how much that costs. And I think people will be shocked to re- recognize and realize, well, a lot of the money that they're earning is going away to taxes anyhow. So if you're earning money through passive income, you don't need as much as you're currently making. And it might not cost as much as you think it is to live and do whatever it is that you're looking to do for a year or two years or what have you. So that's something that I'm going to have to sit down and do as well, because I think it, it is pretty eye opening. Yeah, when you when you have free time, like it totally changes your relationship with money as well. Like, I mean, just think about one specific example. Let, let's say you had the next three months completely free. You could do whatever you wanted to do, and you really didn't have an agenda on where you wanted to travel. Like, let's say post COVID, we can actually travel and gather. <laughs> right. which I'm just itching to do. You know, um, you know, there are deals every day where you could get a flight for two hundred bucks to some place that should cost fifteen hundred bucks to fly to. And if you just like, let's say you spun a wheel, said, I'm just going to go wherever the $200 flight is. Like that's the kind of- Airport roulette. Yeah. Like you can just say, I'm just going like, all right, bingo. I'm going to uh, Singapore. I'm going to, you know, wherever it is, because there's a, because that's the kind of thing you can do when you have flexibility of time. Like most people do their budgets based on this busy work lifestyle where they're working 50, 60 hours a week. They have two weeks of vacation per year. They have to go in those specific two weeks and they have to fly at those certain times. Like, man, when you give yourself a year, a year and a half to do whatever you want to do, like the, the, the cost of things totally changes because if it costs a lot of money to go there, all right, I'll just wait or I'll just take my time or I'll just go to a different place or I'll get there a different way. And that, that's a, it's a totally different mindset. And that's, that's kind of the retirement lifestyle that people think about. But when you build that into your early life as well. And you take many retirements and you just slow things down. You might not need as much money as you really thought you did before. Mm -hmm. I was posting on Twitter the other day, having conversation back and forth with somebody about, I was curious to know how much money people spent having a job. So the work, the clothes, the coffee, the meals, the transportation back and forth. And someone goes, I'm sure someone already did this. And so of course somebody had, and it was like several thousand dollars a year so you subtract that out, you take out the taxes. I mean, it really starts to become more manageable, I think, than, than a lot of people realize. Yep. Emil, you got anything else? <laughs> no, these were, this is the main stuff I wanted to ask Shah. This is super lightning. I, I think for me, I've bookmarked this article. I know myself, uh, I, I forget this message often and it's so important. It's something I want to like come back to yearly, if not quarterly, to just like reinforce that mentality or else, again, I think if you're competitive, if you're type A, it's really, really easy to lose this message. And it's so, so damn important. I, I have to go back and read it myself. Like every, every, <laughs> everything I write, I like, I, it's like, I am the number one like receiver of this message. It's right. like, it's my, it's like my better self sitting on one shoulder, like talking right. to my little, little de- devil self over here. So this is like the, the uh, stoic Chad writing this thing, talking to the, like the, the Chad who's like, you know, gluttony over here, eat, eating all this food and traveling really fast and buying all these properties. <laughs> like, so I'm, I'm, I'm there as well. And, and I, I think it, but it, it is, I think it comes back a meal too, like what you pointed out, like it's how you set your ambitions. Like, so I, I think, it, I think it's great to be ambitious. Right. Like, I think that's what part of what makes um, entrepreneurship so compelling is that we, we see things out there that bother us and we go out and solve it. Like that's, I think that's amazing. And I admire entrepreneurship and I am a, like through and through in my DNA, I am an entrepreneur. I love it. I think it's awesome. I've just been trying to figure out like, number one, just like, let's find some balance because there's other things in life and you need to take some naps and you need to uh, you know, enjoy your family. That's part one. But then part two is like, where can you channel that ambition in different ways? And that that's like the most intriguing thing for me lately has been like social entrepreneurship is uh, there's a, a Nobel Peace winner, prize winner called uh, Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh who won the Nobel Peace Prize for doing micro lending businesses in Bangladesh. And it's spread kind of around the world uh, as the Grameen Bank. And it's a kind of, like people are very familiar with micro lending now. But he even broader talks about how entrepreneurs, once you've made it financially, or maybe even gotten a little bit of a nest egg, why not turn your 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 energy and your entrepreneur entrepreneurial effort towards social problems and other things that you could solve with a business-like solution 
but then you do it in a way that maybe doesn't make you any profit at all, or does, you know, you're not doing it to make money. And so I'm really intrigued by that. I've been doing it locally with a nonprofit trying to build um, an alternative transportation network in our community. So not just cars, but bikes and walking and people work, you know, moving about who don't have cars or don't want to use cars. Um, that's kind of my little experiment locally. But there's also other interests like affordable housing and healthcare. I mean, you just we could all we can make a list of like problems in our society right. that if we if we had more smart, financially independent entrepreneurs working on them man, like how much better could we be? And I think, I think that's something in our kind of circle of real estate investor podcast and financial independence community kind of people that we could kind of get around that and think of all these smart people that we know thinking about that and having the ambition to free up our time so that we can go change the world together. Like, I think that would be just a pretty cool ambition in the big picture. Love that. Seconded. Yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Well, Chad, Always such a pleasure to have you on, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, you as well. You guys have fun on this podcast. You talk about good topics and good stuff. So. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we, we try. try. <laughs> we try. Um, awesome. Well, Chad, if folks have more questions, would like to reach out to you, would like to get a hold of your books, what's the best way for someone to get in touch? A uh, couple different places. I mean, you, you, I know you'll have the Bigger Pockets link to that article on there. Mm-hmm. So you can go. Um, I check on that article every once in a while. It's been, become pretty popular on there, one of my more popular articles. So I can leave a comment there. And then I also uh, wrote a book for Bigger Pockets called uh, Retire Early with Real Estate, uh, which you can check out. And it's kind of that article even bigger. Like the whole, the whole book is kind of built around that concept and it gets into house hacking and it gets into debt snowballs and it gets into what you do after uh, you achieve kind of your number for financial independence. How do you build some resiliency, some backup plans using entrepreneurship and other things. Um, so the book is definitely something I would recommend to kind of get started. And then I, um, I have a podcast as well. That's kind of centered at coachcarson.com, the real estate and financial independence podcast. And if people would like to add another another one in addition to this podcast to their podcast list, that would be be honored to have you over there. Fantastic. Thanks again, man. And I hope to do it again soon. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Emil. It's great. Great talking to you. Thanks, Likewise. Chad.